Please have a good weekend. Watch out, camera.
Oh, you can slide. That's right. You can go.
Uh, I haven't decided if I'm going to do it or not. Good morning. Welcome to Country Bible Church. So glad you've come to worship with us this morning. Special uh, welcome to those of us who are joining on the live stream. Thanks for being with us this morning. I'm so glad you're here. We're going to have our call to worship this morning from Psalm 27. Where the psalmist prays, Teach me your way, O Lord, and lead me on a level path because of my enemies. Give me not up to the will of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out violence. I believe that I shall look upon the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Let's pray. God, this morning we have come to you. We've come with fears and discouragements, with weariness and baggage. We've brought it. And you meet us here. Father, we want to be those 
who wait for you with patience. In your kindness, God, you will show us your grace and your goodness. Let us look upon you this morning. Let us gaze upon your beauty. Let's be overcome by the majesty of Christ. We worship you and you alone. Thank you for bringing us in the place of your people. Together, we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning. Um, you know, when we have uh, men fill the pulpit, they always start out by saying, I'm not the normal pastor. <laughs> He's the out of town. Well, I'm not the normal worship leader um, this morning, but... Uh, we do, um, uh, Clark and, uh, and his family were able to make a quick trip to Kentucky to see family before school starts, so uh, we're filling in this morning. If you would stand, we're going to worship together this morning.
Well, this morning is our time where we would normally take our offering. Um, the way we uh, are taking our offering at Country Bible Church during this time is we um, have two boxes on the tables as you exit. They're blue boxes, and uh, you are welcome to drop your offering in the box at, at the end of the service day on your way out. Um, and then we do also offer other opportunities for giving. You can give online through uh, the Country Bible Church website or also via mail if you would rather do it that way as well. Um, but let's go to the Lord and just ask him to bless our tithes this morning. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again um, for how you uh, provide for us. And uh, Father, how you're providing for us there in these crazy times. Father, you have blessed uh, Country Bible Church and you continue to do so uh, by the giving of your people. And Father, we just ask that you would just um, honor that uh, in each of these families' lives. And uh, Father, just that you would continue to um, give the leadership wisdom as we uh, use those funds uh, for your glory. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Our mission focus this morning is uh, Horse and Lana Crow. And Horse is with Wycliffe Associates. And um, he sits an update uh, this morning said, Wycliffe, like everyone else, is having to learn a new way to accomplish the work of Bible translation. Since the travel bans, they are increasing um, their online workshops. Um, so everything's kind of transitioning from in-person to online. Uh, many of us have experienced that. Um, he says, we've been able to work with nationals in keeping the transitions going. And he asked for prayers that continue to coordinate the workshops. So let's just remember uh, Horse and Lana uh, this morning. In our bulletin, uh, we've got some uh, a few updates and things that I just want us to remember as we uh, go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Elizabeth Nelson um, had gallstone surgery that was successful, went, went very well, and she is home. Praise the Lord. So let's continue to pray for her recovery. James Craft, he's uh, undergoing treatments for his eyesight. So let's continue to pray uh, for the effectiveness um, and that there's no um, harmful side effects. We want to continue to lift up Sue Wizenin's um, sister-in-law, Holiday. Um, she's recovering from surgery, um, but is scheduled to have a follow-up surgery in September. So uh, let's continue to lift her up. Let's remember Grace Treherne's uh, uh, infant nephew, Denver, um, a little guy that's been diagnosed with cere cerebral palsy uh, and partial brain damage, um, but is also uh, experiencing seizures. They've had to change the medication on that, um, and it has um, strong side effects. So let's pray uh, that the medication will work without um, him having to experience the side effects. Also, just lift up his parents in this time. Um, Melissa Hawk, a business associate of the Mandronis, is undergoing chemo for ovarian cancer. We want to continue to lift up Richard Crouch. He's a friend of the Wrights that uh, uh, has pancreatic cancer. Valdemar Garcia, uh, Ursula's dad, just uh, he's continuing to have treatment for stage four cancer in his spine. And Lucas Green, also a friend of Rachel Rogers, um, that's uh, uh, going through chemo with leukemia. So uh, there's many listed here in our bulletin and on our vine. Uh, we want to remember, um, and just remember, um, some schools have started up, but I know Kaufman ISD starts up Monday. Many other school districts starts up Monday. I know that um, teachers and staff members and administrators all around um, have been um, just dealing with mountains of stress. Um, and um, so let's remember them uh, this morning too as we go Lord in prayer because um, and they experience new changes every day, new rules, new guidelines, and um, in trying to help the kids adjust to such a different environment um, is a big challenge. So let's pray for our, our schools, uh, our kiddos as they get ready to go back. And um, if y'all will go to the Lord in prayer, I will close our time. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, um, 
just the opportunity to enter to this place um, where we can be amongst believers um, and be able to to sit um, and, and worship you and to stand and sing and lift our voices to you um, because of what you did by sending your son to die on the cross um, to cover our sins, Father. Uh, what a blessing it is to be able to be here um, this morning to do that. Um, Father, that we, that we can do that. Um, Father, there's times that the weariness and things that are going on in our personal lives can um, try to rob us of our joy and take us away from you. And Father, um, just thank you that um, uh, you are bringing us here together this morning, Father. Father, um, this morning uh, we want to remember Horse and Lana um, as they uh, continue to work with Wycliffe and, and, and help with all the coordinations and the learning the different ways and of reaching the people's groups that they're working on translations with and having to do it. Um, they're oftentimes working with remote in remote situations anyway, but now figuring out ways to do it um, uh, remotely online and uh, via different technology. Uh, when technology is hard in some of those places to get to, Father, we ask that you would just continue to guide them, uh, Father, that, um, uh, that the work would still go forward. And Father, just thank you for Horse and Lennon and their ministry uh, with Wycliffe. And Father, I ask that you would continue just to provide for them and protect them and their health and, um, and the work that, that you've called them to do, Father. And just um, this morning, Father, um, we do want to lift up all of the school districts and all of the administrators and our teachers um, who have put in tireless hours of uh, revamping the way that they teach and the way that they um, manage their classrooms and um, Father, um, the way that we're going to be getting kiddos to school and Father, just um, uh, protecting each and every one um, in the midst of, of this COVID. Father, we ask that you would just continue to guide and direct that you would provide strength and energy and uh, Father, clarity uh, when, when things um, come up that um, we're unsure of. Father, just that you would protect and guide Father, that kids would feel safe and comfortable, and Father, um, uh, just that it would be uh, bring much joy being reunited with teachers and, and friends on campus and being able to uh, have some kind of, just being able to go to school again, Father. Father, just guide um, all districts, all schools, all, all faculty, um, Father, in, in the days ahead, and Father, um, and just again, keep everyone safe, Father. Father, we do um, want to continue to lift up those in our bulletin. Um, we mentioned um, so many, uh, and Father, we do thank you for the successful surgery that Elizabeth had with her gallbladder, and ask that you would just uh, continue her recovery and a complete healing. Father, we do um, ask that you would continue to work in holiday wisdom, and Father, just mend her body and uh, prepare her for this follow-up procedure, and Father, um, just uh, give her the care she needs, um, uh, the medical care at home that she needs, Father, and just continue to uh, just um, go before her, Father. Father, we do want to continue to lift up little Denver to you, Father, just that you would give the doctors uh, wisdom as they um, learn how to treat um, his uh, needs. And Father, um, just that you would give grace upon grace to his parents and family that are working um, to take care of his needs, Father. Um, Father, we do lift up all of those that are going through their different types of cancer. Father, you know each one and you know their struggles. And Father, the chemos that affect each one differently. Um, Father, we ask that you would give appetite where appetite is lost, that you would give strength where uh, muscles are, are wearing down. And Father, just that you would um, uh, sustain their bodies through uh, the treatments and, and all the side effects of what's going on. Um, and Father, just that you would um, bring them through uh, these, this thing called cancer, Father, and bring them to the other side that they may um, experience your healing, um, the healing that only you can provide, Father. Father, just uh, continue to be with us this morning as we worship you uh, and as we uh, prepare to open your word. Uh, Father, that you would speak to us. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. Amen.
Please open with me to Habakkuk chapter 1. Jonah, Mike, and Nahum, Habakkuk. That's how I do it. You'll get there. Started last week, and we are going to continue on. Uh, we'll begin this day in verse 12 of chapter 1. The heading your Bible might call Habakkuk's second complaint. We're calling these questions and concerns, if you will. The word of the Lord, Habakkuk 1.12. Are you not from everlasting, O Lord my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. O Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment. And you, O Rock, have established them for reproof. You who are of pure eyes and to see evil and cannot look at wrong. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You made mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. He brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore he sacrifices to his net and makes his offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. And the Lord answered me, write the vision, make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. For still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Behold, his soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Last summer, we took our kids on a whirlwind tour of the national parks in southern Utah. We did five in three days, which was a little bit crazy looking back on it, but it was a lot of fun. My kids really didn't know much to expect, had much to expect about national parks. We hadn't really exposed them to much yet. And so we were heading to Arches National Park in Moab, Utah, and they really didn't care that much heading into it. They weren't all that excited. We even drove up to Moab, and they're like, we're heading that way. And they're like, okay, cool arches, that's neat, whatever. Because from the road, those arches, if you've ever been there or seen them in pictures, they look pretty small. They seem kind of small. We were far from them. So they weren't all that impressive, but when we forced our children to get out and take a hike to the base of Double Arch, suddenly things changed, right? Those arches that were still a little bitty from the road were absolutely ginormous up close. And then the wonder ensued, right? Things are not always what they seem. The prophet Habakkuk represented the feelings of the people of Judah, his people, in this conversation with God. That's what this oracle, this prophecy is, is a conversation between Habakkuk and God. He's representing Judah. And when he saw what God was doing, and when he saw what God's world was like, and when he saw how God was acting in it, things didn't seem real good to him. And so those feelings that he expressed on behalf of his people were feelings of sorrow and anger and despair. And so God had to remind Habakkuk that everything is not Habakkuk, what it seems. And for you right now, things may seem one way you don't particularly like and might be causing you some heightened questions and concerns. God, this whole time, this whole season we're in just seems out of character for who I know you to be. Maybe that brings up feelings of despair or sorrow or anger. For a lot of people right now, it's just weariness and, and impatience. Let God remind you today through his word that everything is not always as it seems. And that by God's grace, as one who is united to Christ, you are equipped to deal with that. To live, to continue living in a world full of circumstances that seem out of character for a God who claims to be such and such. First of all, God's protection might seem strange. God's protection might seem strange. God takes care of his people 
in ways that we would never conceive. And honestly, he does it in ways that we probably don't always really like. And so sometimes we don't even identify that God is caring for us because the way he's doing it doesn't even compute in our brains as a way to do so. His protection can seem so strange. Here, in order to care for, in order to protect his faithful people in Judah, God ordained to use what seemed to Habakkuk to be a very strange event. He used a, a violent invasion by the Chaldeans, the empire of the day. Now, context from last week, where we were. We ended last week with Habakkuk hearing from God about God's plan to discipline the people of Judah, Habakkuk's own people, by sending the Chaldeans, the Babylonians. He, he, he gave them the first inkling, I'm going to punish the wicked in Judah, Here's how I'm going to do it. I'm going to send a really ruthless nation to wipe them out. To punish your entire nation. That people God planned to raise up in order to put an end to all the corruption that was happening amongst God's people. That Habakkuk was first complaining about at the beginning of chapter 1. So, God sending the Chaldeans was his answer to Habakkuk's first question and concern, which was, God, how long are you going to allow wicked, law-breaking Israelites to be in control in our nation? God says, not much longer. Actually, I'm going to do something you wouldn't have even have guessed. I'm going to send a ruthless nation to wipe out all the lawbreakers, to exile you all in the process. And so the first words that we encounter in this week's passage, starting in verse 12, are Habakkuk's reaction to God's answer to his question. Uh, say what now? <laughs> Habakkuk imagines what's going to happen. That's what's happening now. He's imagining what's going to happen when the Chaldeans tear through the people of Judah. The wicked in Judah will be extinguished. When that happens, which is great. That's exactly what Habakkuk was hoping for. Get rid of all the wicked people. We don't want them anymore. Because it means that those who are being oppressed, this is good. He's thinking this is, it means that all those who are being oppressed in my people, they won't be any longer, which is great. Verse 12, are you not from everlasting, O Lord, my God, my Holy One? We shall not die. We shall not die. because Why? Because of what you will have done, Yahweh, in sending the Chaldeans to wipe out the wicked people. The faithful will not die. Yes. Thank you. Everything that the wicked Israelites were doing that we saw all the way back in verses 2 through 4 would cease. Remember those? Look back at verse 2. Oh, Lord, how long shall I cry for help? You will not hear. Cry to you violence and you will not save. What do you maybe see? Iniquity. Keep going. Destruction and violence are before me. The law is paralyzed. And he goes on, he's saying, this is good. All those things are going to go away. The Chaldeans are going to wipe out the wicked. We will live. God's covenant people, his true believers, will remain. And that's what this is. What Habakkuk's using is covenant language. Are you not, verse 12, from everlasting? It's covenant language that he's using. Thinking back, okay, you made a covenant with my ancestors, with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. God has promised to cause his covenant people to endure. God would preserve his people in this way. He would protect his people. When Habakkuk refers to God as rock, right? Oh, oh Lord, my God, my Holy One. Oh, Lord, you have ordained them as judgment. The end of verse 12 says, oh, Lord, oh, rock, you have established them. He's extolling God's character as protector. Right? That's what rock is meant to, to conjure up in sending the Babylonians to capture and to slaughter wicked Israelites. God was caring for his children. And Habakkuk recognizes that. But still, what a weird way to show you care, Yahweh. Let's keep going in verse 12, second half. O Lord, you have ordained them, the Babylonians, as a judgment. And you, O rock, have established them for reproof. Habakkuk recognizes that it's going to be God who does this. When the Chaldeans come, it's going to be because God sent them. 
He recognizes God's sovereignty there. You have ordained this. You've established this. This is for judgment. This is for reproof or punishment, if you will. But now let's inflect the words at the end of verse 12 a little bit differently and listen to it. Oh Lord, you have ordained them as a judgment? And you, O rock, have established them for reproof? Them? You're using them? God had just given Habakkuk a description of them, the Chaldeans, the Babylonians, in verses 5 through 11. Go back with me. Let's read verse 6 just to get a, a hint of what they were like. God had been talking about them. And he said, For behold, I'm raising up the Chaldeans, that bitter and hasty nation who march through the breadth of the earth to seize dwellings not their own. They are dreaded and fearsome. Their justice and dignity go forth from themselves. You can keep going. God had described the Chaldeans, and it was a frightening, frightening description. As much as Habakkuk is glad that God is going to execute justice in Judah, he's super stunned about who God says will be the ones to do it and how they're going to get it done. You ordained them? You established them? Imagine a, a high school team and whatever competition it might be who gets crushed in round one of this competition. So all they want is for the, the team that beat them to lose in the next round, right? And so they're rooting. Whoever it is, we don't care. Just crush them in the next round. And they look and they realize that the matchup that the, that the next team has drawn is their own arch rival. And they're like, oh, who do we root for now? It's the same kind of thing. This is bittersweet for Habakkuk. Not them, anyone but them, to beat up on us, please. Like you might be thinking about this means of protection as you're thinking, this is, this is God's mean of protection? Habakkuk was asking the same question. He has the same concern. Habakkuk thinks this means of protection for his people is just too weird to be true, to be correct. It seems really strange. This doesn't seem like very caring protection. God uses what seem to us like strange events to protect his faithful people, to protect us, to care for us. Friends, the church, that's church with a capital C, gets lax from time to time. Throughout history, we've seen the passion of the church waver up and down and fluctuate. God knows the church needs to be pruned at times. So the light that the church is to shine to the darkness, doesn't go out, doesn't dim. And so in his care for us, God may do some things that seem really strange to us to light a fire under us. Maybe you've experienced that in your own life. Times you've needed awakening. God has done it in weird ways, maybe. Don't his means of awakening seem strange to you sometimes? The people that he uses seem odd to you sometimes? The church needs unification at times for its preservation. How is the church of God going to endure? How has it endured for centuries, for millennia? Well, not being splintered, and yet the church is made up of a bunch of sinners, and sinners love to splinter. And so God in his provision and his protection of his people he may act to unify us. And sometimes his means of doing so seem really strange. Sometimes God uses persecution to protect his people. Think about the early church and how it grew. And the means of growth was actually persecution. Think of the church in China that continues to just expand in the midst of persecution. Sometimes God uses war to protect his people. Bizarre, but it's true. Think about the early missionaries who went into India and, and Burma. The reason they were able to get there is because Britain had gone in and just smashed everyone and said, okay, you're free, go on in there, preach the gospel, have fun. And God expanded the church. Sometimes God uses weird, weird people to awaken his church. Martin Luther was off his rocker. 
But God used him to wake the church up from slumber, from denying the truth of the gospel. God used the Red Sea to protect his people Israel. The sea just parted it and covered back the Egyptians with it. He may use a natural disaster to bring his people together. He's done it before. Bring his church in solidarity and mission, right? He may use even a pandemic to wake the church up from its slumber. These are all means of protection for God's church, ultimately, strange as they may seem to human eyes. God's protection might seem strange. God's procedure might seem sadistic. God's procedure might seem sadistic. The way we see God accomplishing his purposes doesn't always fit with our sense of goodness, does it? Does it ever seem to you like God is doing things or allowing things just to be cruel? Because you know of his power, his ability. It's like, surely you're just letting this happen just to kind of evilly watch on. And you kind of scratch your head because, because what you see God doing doesn't match your understanding of his character. It's an understanding that you have that's, that's biblically grounded. You think God claims to get no pleasure from the death of anyone. He says that in his word, even the wicked. But man, what he's doing sure does make it seem like he enjoys it a little bit. Seems sometimes like God enjoys your suffering. God's method of punishing the wicked of Judah seemed sadistic to Habakkuk. It seemed like to Habakkuk that God was getting some pleasure from watching them suffer. Just look how terrible the Chaldeans were. Verse 13. You who are pure eye, of pure eyes, and remember Habakkuk's talking to God here. You, God, who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? You made mankind, that's the people of Judah, like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. And so he, Babylon, brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Therefore, Babylon sacrifices to his net, makes offerings to his dragnet, for by them he lives in luxury, and his food is rich. The food feasting upon Judah. Is he then to keep on emptying his net and mercilessly killing nations forever? The Chaldeans were awful, and were going to be awful to Judah. Surely God was taking some sick form of pleasure in Judah's demise. Saying, oh, you know what, my people, they really deserve this, and so I'm going to make this judgment good, and I'm going to enjoy every second of it as it goes down. Like a Roman emperor who brings his enemies in, who he's captured, throws them into the gladiatorial arena and rejoices as their blood is shed. God's procedure didn't match Habakkuk's understanding of God's character. God he says, was supposed to have eyes too pure to even look at evil. Go back to verse 13. You, God, who are of pure eyes than to see evil and cannot look at wrong, why do you idly look at traitors? Meaning you have eyes to see evil and not do anything about it? You have, you have eyes who, who shouldn't be looking at wrong and just letting it happen. It seems like, God, that you're tolerating something that you shouldn't be tolerating. You're supposed to have eyes too pure to even look upon this kind of terror without acting. But it seems like, God, that you just want to stare at it, to ogle it. God was supposed to intervene when people were getting hurt. Look at the end of verse 13. Why do you idly look at traitors and remain silent when the wicked swallows up the man more righteous than he? This isn't you, God. God, are you powerless to stop the Chaldeans once they've started? God, why do you let critics continue to deride you saying, you can't even beat those people. You can't stop it. You're supposed to intervene when people are getting hurt. 
but it just seems like you just want it to go on and on and on. To Habakkuk, it seemed like God was going to enjoy seeing his people get scattered. Verse 14, you make mankind like the fish of the sea, like crawling things that have no ruler. In other words, you're just letting, letting people be governed willy-nilly, just like it's the ocean. And in anything goes sea, there is unchecked violence. That's what Habakkuk is comparing the world to right now. There's something really frightening, right, and, and kind of untamed about the sea that makes most people nervous about jumping into something they can't see the bottom of, right? It's like, what is happening down there? Fish are scattered when danger comes. They're without leaders, defenseless. That's what the world seems like right now to Habakkuk. That's what the Israelites were going to be like when the Babylonians came. And so Habakkuk's saying, you must like this. It must be like a big aquarium for you to just watch it all happening. See us like fish scattering around. And it's all going to go on for so long, this punishment, this discipline. It's going to go on for so long, which to Habakkuk surely means that God must like this bloodbath. To let it go on that long? Habakkuk can see that this punishment is going to go on for a good while. The Babylonians are pictured as evil fishermen. Verse 15, he brings them, that's Babylon, brings all of them, those fish, those people of Judah, people of nations they would conquer, brings all of them up with a hook. He drags them out with his net. He gathers them in his dragnet, and so he rejoices and is glad. Look at all I've conquered. Look at all the peoples I've brought up. Therefore, he sacrifices to his net and makes offerings to his dragnet. For by them he lives in luxury and his food is rich. He's captured so many people. He's just like, I'm living large. That's Babylon. And Habakkuk can see this is, this is not just one nation, not just two, not just three, but nation after nation after nation. That these people are going to do this to. And it did go on for a good long while, the Babylonian rule. They're pillaging and they're violent. Verse 17. Is he then to keep on emptying his net? Just, okay, finish with that one group of people, tossing them out. And mercilessly killing nations forever. Dropping it back down and picking up some more. Went on for decades. The Babylon ruled. And did what they did. And Habakkuk is thinking. Judah is thinking. You wouldn't let something continue on that long if you didn't like it a little bit, God. God's allowance of evil in our world can seem sadistic to us. Just look how terrible things are right now. 2020 is like a curse word, isn't it? It just takes a little bit of news right now to make you sad, to make you angry, to make you depressed or despair or weary. Side note, you should watch, listen to, read less news. You're poisoning your soul. Surely by the way things are dragging out, or by the way things never seem to get resolved, God's just taking some form of sick pleasure in it all. A little bit, right? His procedures, they seem sadistic sometimes. Like he's just sitting in a recliner in heaven, popcorn in hand, with cruel enjoyment at a pandemic. And everyone's reactions to it. As if with some sort of cheerful evil, God is choosing not to intervene when entire people groups are oppressed. Like he's relishing watching whole nations and churches split down the middle over divisive issues. All of these wearying things have been, have, they have gone on for so long, haven't they? Which shows that surely must, God must like at least a little bit like this bloodbath of a world we're living in. God's procedure might seem sadistic. God's progress might seem slow. The speed with which God accomplishes his purposes doesn't usually match our expectations. His answers to our prayers come slowly. His carrying out of, of justice comes slowly. 
His eradication of, of human plights comes slowly. It's agonizing. God was going to punish Babylon too. Not just Judah. He would eventually punish Babylon. They weren't going to get off scot-free for what they will do to Judah. But it was going to be a while before he did that. It was going to be longer until that happened than Habakkuk and Judah surely would have wanted or expected from God. God wasn't just going to let Babylon slide. This is good. He makes sure that Habakkuk knows that good and well. They would be punished for what they were going to do to Judah and to all these other nations that they were dragging up with their dragnet. God would come back and, and give them what they had coming to them. And we'll see details of Babylon's prophesied demise next week. Habakkuk was determined for God to tell him how that was going to go down. It's going to happen, right? Verse 1 of chapter 2. Habakkuk ends his plea with this statement. I will take my stand at my watch post and station myself on the tower and look out to see what God will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Now, this is almost a challenge. It's almost Habakkuk saying, is God actually going to show up with a retort here? Because I've laid out a pretty good argument about how terrible the Chaldeans are. Is he going to have anything to say to me? Habakkuk represents his nation who are standing at their post, waiting to hear what God would say about their circumstance. Is our nation's punishment going to go on forever? Or will there be some sort of change to what we're going through, to our well-being? Is, is it going to change for the better? Now, Habakkuk knows an answer will indeed come. It's clear that he expects an answer from God. In fact, you notice at the end of verse 1 of chapter 2, he's already starting to plan what he's going to say next after God answers him. Isn't that weird? Look out and see what he will say to me and what I will answer concerning my complaint. Habakkuk apparently wasn't very good at active listening. He's already, he's already listening, thinking about what he's going to say before God even responds. But he knows, even though he knows God's answer is going to come, he also knows that God's answer may not come until after some waiting. Some waiting. God would end Judah's discipline. God would wipe out the Chaldeans in punishment for their sins, but not until he appointed. Verse 2. And the Lord answered me, Write the vision. Make it plain on tablets so he may run who reads it. Habakkuk could be certain that justice would roll down. When he talks about the vision the vision he's saying is the vision of me punishing the Chaldeans. That's what God's telling Habakkuk. Write that vision down. It's going to happen. God's about to deliver that vision to Habakkuk in just a minute. He's saying, write it down. Make it plain on tablets. That's meant to stir the people's image of what? The Ten Commandments, right? Which was the, really the first amazing time that God gave his people this incredible revelation of himself, right? Of his character and who he was. And so they're thinking now again, yes, God's going to reveal something to us. Like he did in that stone. He's going to act. And God says, it's going to be plain enough. This, this last line says, so that he who runs may read it. He may run who reads it. The idea is that it's going to be plain enough. This vision will be clear enough and easy enough for everyone to see and understand so that someone who's just running her eyes over it real quick on that tablet will be able to know just like that it's true. Yep. Yep. It's happening. It's going to happen. It's for sure. The catch was that Habakkuk and Judah would probably have to wait longer to see it than they hoped. Verse 3. For, or but, maybe, still the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. This vision of God conquering Babylon and wiping them out is coming at an appointed time. Literally, Hebrew is in its season. Aren't there certain things that only come to us in certain seasons of our years, right? Things you expect, you get excited about X when fall comes because it doesn't happen in the summer. 
You get excited about X when winter comes because it doesn't happen in fall. Same kind of deal. This isn't happening until it's appointed season. This was the time when what was prophesied would come to pass. This invokes imagery. Again, God is just recalling his people, helping them to think back to their history. This one, he's trying to make them think about Abraham, who was waiting for an appointed season when the promises that God had made for him would come true. It will not lie. This vision that you're having of me punishing Babylon will not lie, God says, which implies what? That what Habakkuk sees happening in his world, slowly. What he sees happening so slowly will appear, will appear to contradict what Habakkuk knows is supposed to be happening. He will think that vision is lying. God says it will not lie. The vision is true, no matter what you see. It may not seem like it's coming to pass, Habakkuk, but it is just a whole lot slower than you're expecting it to or that you want it to. God's acting, God's intervening might seem excruciatingly slow to us sometimes. We pray and we pray and we pray virus has gone on long enough. We have issues in our nation that rear their heads over and over. Racism pops up again here and it pops up again there. War has gone on long enough, hasn't it? There has never been a single time in the history of the world where one has not been happening somewhere. Where is the progress? God is going to bring an end to these things. And is even in the process of ending them. He inaugurated that process of the coming of Christ. But they won't be ended until the time he has appointed his season. You can be certain, like Habakkuk was, but you might have to wait longer than you hope to see it. It might seem slow. God's progress might seem slow. His procedure might seem sadistic. His protection might seem strange. Such is how things often seem. But God's people... God's people don't live by how things seem, do they? By how things look. No. God's people live by faith. Don't live, friends, by how things seem. Live by faith. Verse 4. Behold, his soul, God says, of Babylon, Babylon's soul is puffed up. It is not upright within him. He's in trouble. But the righteous shall live by his faith. Don't live by how things seem. Like Babylon, like Judah was tempted to, live by faith. God is contrasting in verse 4 the Babylonians with his faithful people. And his faithful people, those who have been made righteous by him, they will live and they will live by faith. Meaning, they will walk through the times that seem, that seem to be one way by believing in the promises that God has given. And that is what will enable them to endure in those times. This phrase, the righteous shall live by faith, is repeated several times in the New Testament. You know it. It came right here from Habakkuk chapter 2. But it's not just about the way Paul uses it in Romans, 
which is a big way. It's also used in Hebrews in a little bit different way. It's not just about being justified, that act of salvation, where we're justified by being saved by faith alone. It is about that, but it's also here about continuing to live by faith. Rather than what? Rather than by living by what you see or by living by how things seem. We might just simply put this phrase like this. The justified, those who are justified by faith, continue to live by faith. As someone has said it this way, faith is what faith does. For instance, you can claim to have faith in a bridge. But if you are unwilling to cross that bridge, you don't. Faith is what faith does. God gave Habakkuk and Judah this challenge to live by faith before he gave them any real insight into his plans. He, gave, he said the vision's coming, but he didn't say what it was. Not yet. He just said live by faith that it's coming. He's going to give them that vision a little bit later. That's why it's faith. They must trust that what God says he will do will come to pass. And they must live in or by that faith. Though things seem one way to God's people, yet God's people make their beds in the trust that what God says about what he will do is true. No matter how they seem. That sometimes a thing is not as it seems. And it's only God's people who have what it takes to live with that. Faith. Because, friend, Christian, you have been gifted the faith to live in the hope of what truly is. It's a gift. Rather than having to live in how things seem. You don't anymore. Because God has given you faith. Martin Lloyd-Jones said it this way. He says it, it is essential that God's people should not view things with a political eye, meaning looking out on the world as it seems, thinking purely in political terms, but that they learn to interpret events spiritually. That ability has been given you by faith, the eyes to see, the ears to hear. God's protection is not strange. Rather, our conception of strangeness is off, isn't it? And so we live by faith that the strangeness that we perceive isn't actually strange to Almighty God, who is the one ordaining the ways that he wants to care for us. God's procedure is not sadistic. Rather, our conception of divine goodness is off. We live by faith that God only takes delight in goodness. And so he is not, he cannot delight in our painful experiences of the brokenness of this world. Rather, he weeps with us. While yet still allowing the brokenness for our good and for his glory. God's progress is not slow. Rather, our understanding of time is off. And so we live, how? Not by how things seem, but by faith. That we serve a God who exists above the bounds of infinite, of a finite time. And thus he is never slow. He is always perfectly paced. Like Habakkuk and Chapter 2, verse 1, we must stand at our watch posts and wait for the Lord, for he will surely come. Verse 3, he will not delay. Sometimes the fulfillment of a promise seems like it's delaying, when in reality it's just being answered over time. Almost 
imperceptibly. Habakkuk had realized that he didn't like the world that he saw. He didn't like the way it seemed to him when he looked around, which is why he had to live by faith that in God's providence, everything was not as he saw or as it seemed. Don't live, church, by how things seem. Live by faith. Faith that God's means of protection are good and purposeful. Faith that God's procedures are always true and just and right. Faith that God's progress in your life and the lives of others around you is perfectly timed. Every time. United to Christ, you can endure all things by faith. Let's pray. God, we need your grace for this. And we know that faith itself is a gift of your grace. And so we're crying out for more of it because our faith ebbs and it flows. We approach you like those who approached Jesus and said, Oh, my faith is small. Help my unbelief. God, we know you can grow it more within us to put our trust in the rock-solid promises that you have made no matter how things seem. Teach us, God. Grow us in that, Lord. We are weak and you are strong. But you have united us to Christ, the strong one who broke the bonds of sin and death. His power is ours through faith and unity with him. May we realize it, recognize it more and more and more. Thank you, O oh God, for sending your Son to do what we never could, that we might live by this faith, enduring as your people, day after day after day. In Jesus' name.
A couple quick reminders before we close with the benediction. Uh, we'll have the offering boxes there in the back the door. We'll exit from the back. If you've been with us before, we exit from the back one row at a time. If you're in this section, you'll exit to that side. If you're in this section, you'll exit to this aisle. So wait for our ushers to let you know when it's your aisle's turn. That would be awesome. Let's pray together. May the God of grace give you more grace this week and beyond to live beyond what things seem, but to live by faith. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Thank you. said.
teachers are trying to make this fun, you know, normal. Did you turn your phone off? Are you still live streaming? I'm still live streaming. Sorry. 